So we got two years of play calling on Kevin O'Connell. What do we think? I'll answer that and the rest of your questions on the Locked On Vikings podcast. You liked it on three, one, two, three. You, liked it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to those of you who listen to this show every single day. My hashtag everydayers, I love hearing from you. Get more emails from you lately. Love that. You can send an email anytime you want to lockedonvikingspodcast at gmail.com about whatever. If you are new here, Hello, welcome. My name is Luke. I will be your host. You can find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is anywhere where you listen to audio podcasts uh, like the Sirius XM app, which you can also use. You can search out like Timberwolves and get hometown Timberwolves broadcasts on there. Uh, you can also find the show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Today's Tuesday. That means it is Twitter Tuesday, and I'm answering your questions, mostly from Twitter, but you can also fill out the Google form in the show notes. Again, send me an email uh, or even leave a YouTube comment, and I will get to it some way or another. And a couple of you had similar questions about Kevin O'Connell, so we're going to start there. First one comes from Eric the Red, who says, you've watched Kevin O'Connell call plays on offense for two seasons now. What's your opinion of him judging solely his skill as an offensive play caller? Okay, so solely. So that means we're not talking about timeouts, game management, culture, any of that stuff, which is honestly where most of my criticisms lie. I think if we're judging O'Connell solely as a play caller, I think that's going to be the most glowing reflection that you get of Kevin O'Connell. Uh, as a play caller, there's all kinds of very cool stuff that he is doing, uh, that like I have been able to learn just from observing, which is always really fun. Um, he, for example, right. The, the primary issue he had coming into this season when it came to schematics was how do you deal with Justin Jefferson getting bracketed, right? That was the whole thing of 2022. Everybody just put a safety over the top of him, press the hell out of him all day. What do you do about that? And and the Vikings just spammed two beaters all season long. And Justin Jefferson got a thousand yard season in, in nine games. Uh, ten games, was it? Completely insane. Nine games, I'm going to say, because the Vegas one doesn't count. He was out of that one in like the first quarter. Uh, completely insane Justin Jefferson production. And I think finding that in the face of backup quarterback play and, you know, the same schematic challenges that he had last year shows and adaptability. And that's what I'm really looking for in a play caller. I think a lot of people see play calling as like, what's his run pass ratio, which by the way, if you're one of those people that just like really, really wants them to pass a lot, you, you got it. They are, uh, below league average in like running on second and 10 or they're, they're a way past happier team than average. I think they're a little bit above average in terms of going on for, Oh no, they were like, they go for it a lot on fourth down, but they don't go for it. Like more than the models say on fourth down. Like they just happened to be happened this year to be in a lot of like fourth and ones, but like they weren't aggressive as compared to those models, like on the whole on fourth down, they weren't going for like the fourth and fives that you'll see a lot of other teams go for. That's not what I mean when I'm talking play calling for me. I'm talking about how things evolved schematically over the season. And in, in particular for me, the biggest thing with play calling is, are you putting your players in a spot to succeed? I think TJ Hawkinson's a great example of this. TJ Hawkinson was asked to do what he was good at. Now, he had a lot of outside the frame catches that he didn't bring in, and that was very frustrating, and that's not so much a play calling thing. That's just, hey, the coverage was where it was, the ball was where it was. It's not really on the coaches. Sometimes it's just circumstance, right? It's not on anybody. But when it comes to, you know, how many times did you convert a third and 11 on, on like, why delay or why choice to... TJ Hawkinson, just an underneath throw to Hawkinson, making him, you know, split two linebackers and convert. That's what he's good at. And putting him in a position to convert a third and 11 by doing what he's good at, that's play calling. That's that's what the play callers do. Play callers are just Sherpas. They lead you up the mountain, but the players are the ones that actually climb. So I like it. Uh, I I like him as a play caller a lot. And I don't think O'Connell had a perfect season by any means, but I am 
pretty happy with like that particular facet of it. Similar question comes from Nate, who says national media hails KOC as a savant and he schemes thing open, things open from what I've seen. Has he been in places with a lot of RPOs to get some ideas if we do go with a mobile QB and has Kirk run any of them in Minnesota? So I don't know. I can't go too far back with with him. Like when he was a quarterback with like Belichick and and I think he was on the Rex Ryan Jets. Uh, I don't know how those offenses work, so I can't answer it there. But when it comes to like his actual influences off the McVay tree in coaching, um, there is an RPO package. It's not all that frequently called, but it's there. It's installed. You've got to understand how it works. Uh, it's kind of hard to pick out what is a a, a true RPO and what isn't it, 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 unless you're like specifically looking at how deep the line goes. That's the best way I know, but that's not like something you do unless you're consciously thinking about like determining if that was an RPO or if it was just a handoff. <laughs> Which, like, that's not a thought that a lot of us have like on Sundays watching the game. So it's, it's inconspicuous, the RPO package, but it is there. Kirk has definitely run RPOs for sure. It's part of it. Um, you could, kind of view play action and bootlegs and stuff as a pseudo RPO in the way that it is meant to sort of still stress the defense on run versus pass. It's just predetermined, you know, and that's sort of play action and RPO go hand in hand in that way. Um, School Actuary says, what are the odds that the top three quarterbacks go in the first to three picks, assuming no trades? Okay. Um, I don't know the odds at all because I have no idea what the Bears are going to do. Complete mystery to me, but it sort of hinges on the Bears. So I have seen so many things that sort of imply that the Bears are going to just sit there at one and take Caleb Williams, sort of implies that the Bears are going to stick with Fields. They hired Shane Waldron. He is of a similar coaching ilk as Luke Getze was. Like they're kind of, they've got the same influences. So it shouldn't be, if Justin Fields does have to learn that new offense, it shouldn't be like a crazy lift for him. So that kind of feels like a move that you would make if you were planning on keeping Justin Fields. But Caleb Williams has a similar skill set to Justin Fields, so maybe it's for him. So it's like hard for me to tell. But I'm kind of penciling in New England and Washington as teams that'll take a quarterback or that teams that need a quarterback because maybe one of them ends up with Russell Wilson and then they don't draft one, right? Uh, or with Kirk Cousins and then they don't draft one. It'd be very funny if he ended up in Washington, but that doesn't feel impossible. I don't know. Uh, the, the point is those two teams need a quarterback. And the Bears might need a quarterback, but if they get a quarterback, they are giving up Justin Fields and then another team and maybe Justin Fields is a Falcon now, right? Now we don't have to worry about trading up past him or whatever. So it's all kind of like there, there's so many teams of the quarterback and the quarterbacks will sort of sort themselves out there. Um, but I would say if the Bears pick a quarterback and Washington and New England do not get a veteran, then one, two, three feels pretty likely. But those are the conditions that have to be met. None of them are guarantees. Uh, Dr. Bob says that it is free agency and you can have one of the two chiefs free agents this offseason at their market rate, Chris Jones or Legereus Sneed. Which do you prefer? That's a very hard question. I, I would probably go with Chris Jones because he's more proven and Legereus Sneed's coming off a of one hot season. Sometimes corners that can like that that can be a flash in the pan. But without trying to make any determinations there, looking at Brad Spielberger's um, and over the caps contract projections, I'm looking at it via PFF. Uh, Legereus Sneed costs 17 and a half mil a year. Chris Jones costs 30 mil a year. That's the projected amounts that I'm rolling with here. So Chris Jones is significantly more expensive, probably for the reasons I just said. But I think I'm still going with Chris Jones. I don't know. It's just it's just a little easier to trust that. There's just a, a, an inherent risk with with Legereus Sneed that it may be. I mean, he's been solid and he's kind of a flash in the pan now or he's, he's peaking now. He's, he's made this really great step forward. I would have to watch him a little more to know like if I trust him. Maybe I'll watch some Chiefs defense tape and go, oh my God, I love this guy. But i probably only do that if the Vikings sign him. Uh, so I'll go with Chris Jones for now. Train Rider says, Brian Flores returning as DC is a plus, even if only for continuity, right? Or is his scheme solved? Isn't that the question? Is he, is he going to be able to change this in a way that, you know, the Lions can't just like dust off their game plans from the 2023 seasons and put up 500 yards on us again? Um, but yes, absolutely. Brian Flores returning is a, is a great thing for continuity because I mean, there are guys like Lewis seen, uh, and booth like these, the 2022 guys that have had to learn a new defense every year of their, their careers. 
not having to do that another year, that's going to be nice for those guys. But yeah, it's a question of, are we sticking to a good plan here? Because that plan kind of became pretty bad at the end of the season. That's the taste that's left in our mouths. There were 10 weeks of it that were very good. Uh, and I have a feeling that Brian Flores is not exactly one to rest on his laurels. <laughs> he does not seem like a guy that prefers to stagnate. So I, I feel okay about it. at least we're going to see him try something new. Will it work? Eh, who's to say, right? Flores isn't even to say. That's kind of why we... We bet on the games, but uh, yeah, continuity at least. I've got a whole bunch more questions, a lot of questions about Kirk Cousins coming up, so uh, we'll do those next. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book, and betting Christmas is around the corner, so get yourself ready. FanDuel is the number one sports book for a reason. That's because you can find everything there from spreads and player props and all of that to parlays, all sorts of wacky props, especially when it comes to Super Bowl time is a really fun time. I'll probably go over some of them just for fun for like a, a bold prediction Friday or something before the Super Bowl. I don't know. Let me know if you would like that or if that would feel like you're just it's a waste of time on a Vikings podcast. Um you can even bet on stuff from the NFL draft on who's going to be the number one overall pick right now. If it's not Caleb Williams, that's plus 700. And you can put five bucks on that. If you're new, you can go to fandle.com slash locked on, put 500 bucks on, on Caleb Williams to not be the number one overall pick uh, at plus 700. And whether or not that bet wins or loses, you get 150 bucks back in bonus bets. 30 to one odds on that, that you just get in bonus bets just for placing the bet, whether it wins or loses. So go to fanduel.com slash locked on to get started there. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Moving on with this Twitter Tuesday episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast. Thank you so much for hanging out and watching uh, Locked On Vikings or listening to Locked On Vikings. When you're done here, if you're watching on YouTube, don't lift a finger. It'll take you right to the 24-7 live stream at the Locked On Minnesota Sports YouTube page. Or go check it out yourself. 24-7 Minnesota Sports, all locked on all the time. Uh, moving on with this Twitter Tuesday episode here, the next one comes from a guy. So I'm pretty sure your username is like personal information because it's just a bunch of numbers. So I would, I would check on that, but I'm not going to read it, <laughs> but it's a guy who's a bunch of numbers, uh, who says, is there a scenario where the Vikings could sign and trade cousins? Does that even make sense? So that's like the NBA move thing, right? Where they like sign him and trade him in the NFL. That doesn't really make sense. I don't know how the NBA salary cap works with sign in trades. Um, but once Kirk Cousins, so so the way it it would work if they sign and traded him would be the same as if they let him walk when it comes to um, dead money, right? And the only reason that that would be anything is if they wanted to sign him to some money and like say they, they trade him to the Raiders and th the Raiders need the Vikings to pay half of his contract for that contract to work. So they can't let him hit free agency because they can't afford the contract that they want to give him. So the Vikings need to pay some of it off and, and the Raiders will give the Vikings draft picks to do that. I suppose that's theoretically possible, but that feels like just a random favor you would do for another team. And I don't know why you do that unless the draft competition was like pretty, was like significant enough. And also he's probably just going to hit free agency. If the Vikings don't get a deal done with him, he gets to hit free agency and he's going to go, you know, do his own negotiations and he will void by like the end of the tampering period, I guess. So it'd be really difficult to negotiate all that. Once he hits free agency, that 28.5 million dead is locked in and signing him to money and then trading him away would sort of do nothing. There'd be no reason to do that for like the other team wouldn't need to do that. They could just sign him outright without the Vikings being involved. Uh, interesting question though. Christopher Olson says, first time asking question, fairly new to listening. Well, what is up, Christopher Olson? Hello and welcome. Uh, question is, after watching the playoffs games, does it seem to be more likely to show we need to move on from Cousins and use that money to build up our team? Okay, so because you're new, this is this is sort of the broad question that, that I will get at in some way in like every show. So let me just lay it out, uh, even though, like, let me lay it out in like clearer terms. My Kirk Cousins take is that I don't I don't think that he is the a consistent enough quarterback to make a four game playoff run. And I don't think he's consistent enough to get a one seed either and make it three. 
uh you know be the be the 15 win team that gets like i don't i don't think it's consistent enough there are so many things that kirk cousins does so well in terms of mechanics and, and all kinds of really cool stuff cool plays that he's been making he's been more improvisational lately and all of that stuff but you still you just get the couple of stinkers every year uh and we even had one we won that game but carolina was kind of one of those games where he came out oh, he came off that game really upset with how he played um you can't have those. I mean, look at Jordan Love, right? Play three quarters great, fall apart for another quarter, you lose the game, your season's over. That's all it takes. You need to be consistent to win in this to win the Super Bowl. Uh so I I'm out of it, right? So yeah, there you go. There's your I guess your your playoffs that shows us what we need to do with cousins. That said, it's a much more complicated question than that because there's the money aspect of it. There's what if we can't draft someone? It's a lot safer to keep cousins because then you can't get sniped in the draft and be left high and dry, right? But maybe you want to take that risk in the interest of moving on. There's all these other factors to it that are, you know, worth entire shows in and of themselves. Uh, Pete says, if there's a moderately team friendly deal on the table from the Cousins camp that included a guaranteed 2025 and the Vikings rejected it, which, by the way, is exactly what happened before uh, camp. That that's what Ben Gessling reported. There was a team friendly deal less than 40 million dollars a year was already offered and rejected by the Vikings because of the 2025 guarantees. Um, why does it feel like Kwesi and KOC have no backup plan or succession plan? And if they do, what is it? it? feels like right now we're in a position where Kirk has the upper hand. So I don't think that position means Kirk has the upper hand because if he did, then the Vikings would have had to say yes to that in the first place in the summer, which they didn't. And now the only thing that has changed is another year has gone by and Kirk's coming off an Achilles now, which absolutely puts extra risk in, into his value and that will be reflected in contract terms right whether that means you know less guarantees than there would have otherwise been or less money than there would have otherwise that been or both that will be reflected i think kirk is kind of just at the mercy of whether or not the vikings are willing to move forward with him for more than a year and the way for kirk cousins to be a viking is for him to say okay i'll do a one-year deal which he doesn't want to do but he might have to uh, or maybe he decides he's going to take his chances on the market. And if he gets a one-year deal on the market, then so be it. But he's got to try, right? I think that's the decision. And honestly, yeah, I think that is in Kirk Cousins' court a little bit because the Vikings have been very clear about what they want. If, you're, if you'll come for a year, we're good. And if not, then no. As for a succession plan, I do not think that they have honed in on a guy necessarily. Well, they probably have a guy that they love in scouting, right? But options are good. Flexibility is good. They're not going in blind, if that's what you think. I mean, they, they are going to intimately know every option. They have probably looked in, had lots of conversations about Russell Wilson, right? And if they want, if they're interested in that, they probably talked a whole bunch about, I don't know, Baker Mayfield, if he hits free agency. Is that a thing that we're going to do? What about all these draft guys, right? They're probably spending every waking moment thinking about all these college quarterbacks. So they're going to have their idea of what they like and what they don't. They're probably not going to be honed in on one guy because that's kind of a narrow-minded way to look at it, right? Be open to a lot of different options. I hope that there's a guy that they are in love with. That guy was Anthony Richardson last year. They didn't get him. Uh, if there is a guy that they're in love with, they'll be really motivated to go up and get him. And I, that would be really fun. Uh, Jish Fish asked, speaking of, what, if anything, can we learn from Anthony Richardson being the QB that KOC and Kwesi were willing to sell the farm for? And do you think that can provide any insight into the 2024 QBs they may be interested in? So speculating on this is really dangerous, uh, but also kind of fun. So let's do it. But it's like that you, you could like get the, like they could have just liked Anthony Richardson because he was young or they could have liked Anthony Richardson because he was a home threat, home run threat with his legs. That will give you which which one you believe there will give you a very different prediction on what they think of Jaden Daniels, who is a home run threat with his legs, but he's older. Um, I, so I don't know. I do, we don't know enough about them to know exactly what trait that was, but it'd be really cool if like that was their guy and Jaden Daniels was their guy and they had to go try to trade up to the top three, which will probably cost a couple first round picks and change. And they were willing to spend way more than that last year. So like that probably won't be that much of an obstacle. Like price won't be an obstacle, right? It's quarterback. They're going to go get their guy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like really hard to parse that out. That'll be a way more fun question to answer after we know who the guy is. And then we'll, we'll, then we'll be able to look and see, okay, that's the thing they had in common. They must like quarterbacks that have X trait. Um, I have a lot more questions than I hoped I would left to go. So we're going to go rapid fire uh, in just a minute. 
Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by Game Time. If you've been thinking about maybe making that trip out to Vegas for the big game, why don't you check out Game Time? They are the best place to get last minute tickets to anything. And it's pretty last minute if we're talking about uh, the big one out in Vegas. So uh, if you are thinking about going to anything, whether it's maybe a Wolves game, concert, theater, whatever, check out Game Time. You can get flash deals, last minute deals. Everything is super upfront. There's no hidden fees. You see your total next to that seat, like what you would actually pay. If you don't like, the, if you don't get the best price, they have the game time guarantee. That means if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, the game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Right now, all game time users can get $100 off of a big game ticket if you use code VEGAS100, V-E-G-A-S-100. Terms apply. Just download the game time app and use code VEGAS100 for 100 bucks off a big game ticket. Or if you're not going to that game, use code locked on for 20 bucks off of your first purchase on anything else. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Let's finish strong here on the Locked On Vikings podcast. Next one comes from Scene Season, who says, do you think Lewis Scene has a path forward? And do you believe the consensus on him is way lower than it should be? <laughs> I love the bit. I respect the bit. We are now in the offseason, so I will answer this uh, in a, a more direct and serious way. Okay, so here's the path forward for Lewis Scene. One, you have to improve at tackling. We have to see him in the preseason not miss tackles. That's what sunk him. That's, that's what got him to not move above Theo Jackson and Metellus and all of these guys. Um, the path forward also probably includes Harrison Smith retiring, right? And then you've got a three safety package with Metellus, Bynum, and Scene. I think that's going to be their plan. Somebody else in here actually had that question. It was Waka Waka who said, can we feel good about our safety room if Smith retires or does that become a need? I would love some competition, but I don't think it's a need uh, that requires you to spend like starting money on it bring in a guy, an intermediate player, a borderline starter player, but I don't think it's a need you have to spend a lot of resources on, but you will need like a body. Um, so if it's those three and scene gets better at tackling, then that is the path forward. Now he's just, there it is. He's got his role in the defense and he plays it for how, however many times the Vikings want to use that package that game. Um, and that is something that you can improve on. And, and the coaches have insisted you know, and of course they're going to, Hey, look, he lost his rookie year to this injury. He was basically doing another rookie year. He was learning a new scheme. There's a lot of stuff working against him. And that that's true. And that might even be valid, but that doesn't stop being true. So that doesn't like, it's never useful projecting forward. That's the path forward. Or he doesn't improve at that. He's just not a guy that tackles and he flames out. And that happens with first rounders all the time. Like then, then we just are, all right, we whiffed on one. Uh, Cam X storm says, does fan reaction to running back contracts help to depress the market? Since running backs don't matter, discourse started, GMs and teams face more scrutiny for signing and extending running backs for big money. It, there's a trickle-up effect, I think, in some ways where a lot of discourse will happen, And but, uh, but I think what's key is that discourse has to get on TV. It has to get to the mainstream places. I don't think GMs are looking on Twitter and seeing what people are saying, but I think blog writers are. And, and I think you know, TV execs read some of those big blog, right? You know, people who write for Bleacher Report and stuff will, TV execs will go, hmm, what are people talking about? And then they will set the topics for NFL Live. And GMs might be watching NFL Live. Like, it has to kind of be pervasive enough to make it there. But I do think that there is something to that where that national conversation will at least get you to think. Although, again, I, these people are, are have like millions of dollars on the line. They're probably doing more of their own work uh, than... <laughs> than just watching some TV. Uh, Mark Simpson says, why should I have confidence that management is going to draft better this season? I don't, I don't think you should have confidence in any in, in them drafting well or poorly at all. The draft is a total crapshoot. I don't think you should go in with any expectation, good or bad. Uh, I, I think the healthiest way to approach the draft is to say, well, we'll see what happens. Here are the guys that I like. Be humble about that. Say, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that. I didn't like Christian Derrissaw coming out. I was wrong about that. I say I, I you can go listen to my 2021 draft recap episode where I said, ah, I don't love this pick. I, I think I said I like it. I think I, said, I was like, OK with it because I had him as a battle late first rounder was clearly wrong about that. What can I learn from that? I've also done that show um, and, you know, now reassess. Hey, look, that was a pretty good pick. Great. Um, 
The 2023 class, though, is looking pretty good. I mean, Addison, Makai Blackman being functionally a starter in his first year is pretty good. You got Ivan Pace, of course. Some people really don't want to count him as part of the quote unquote draft class. I don't really get that. Like he's a guy, he's a rookie they acquired, right? They just didn't spend anything on him. If anything, that's better. Um, there's That's a lot to get from a rookie class already. Uh, and you're not even talking about, you know, rotational contributions from guys like Jaquel and Roy. Uh, so there, there's a lot to like about that uh, that rookie class so far. A lot to not like about the 2022 class. I don't know. We'll see. I don't think you should go in with an expectation at all, but you shouldn't hang your hat on them doing it better. Yeah, for sure. Uh, ben King Quayle says, how do you find the difference in value between drafting a running back and the current running back market? So it has, for me, it has to do with the classes themselves. Who is in the class, right? So the running back market has a lot of dudes in it. I went over that yesterday. There's Josh Jacobs, Tony Pollard, Saquon Barkley, DeAndre Swift. I'm sure not all of those guys will hit free agency, but there's a lot of guys slated to hit free agency. So if that's a really saturated market, and I have no idea who's coming out at running back, I, I couldn't name you one. Um, so I'll look at that at a later date, uh, and then you can compare and say, well, there's a lot of guys in the draft. There's also a lot of guys in free agency. They're probably going to you know, depress each other's value. Or there's not a lot of guys in, in the draft. There's a lot of guys in free agency, which means that one guy that's left in the draft, so there's one good running back in the draft, just hypothetically. If you say uh, miss out on your free agent running back, all the free agent running backs go to other teams, you don't have a running back. And there's one good guy in the draft. You might be a little bit more motivated to get that guy, and that guy's value might increase. And by the way, everybody else already got their uh, their running back, so there's a better chance that he'll fall to you, making his value decrease back. And there's a whole dynamic kind of system there uh, that is subject to like complicated economics math that we don't have to go over. Uh, Casey the Coolest says, who can put, you can put one defensive player from the Vikings from 2000 to 2022 in their prime on next year's roster. Who is it? They can't be in the Hall of Fame or a finalist or the Ring of Honor. Oh, you didn't, you didn't word it right. I get to say Patrick Peterson, prime Patrick Peterson. <laughs> he's not in the ring of honor. He's not a hall of fame. He's not anything yet. Uh, he was only here for a couple years, but he is a former Vikings defensive player. I get him in his prime. Gotcha. <laughs> this is such a great question. Wait, okay. Let me think of a more serious answer of somebody that, that is like cool, but unheralded EJ Henderson. Yeah. EJ Henderson. That would be the one. That's the guy I'm going to say. Uh, Bradley Knorr says, how many years do you think we are away from having a truly Super Bowl caliber roster? Feels like one offseason isn't enough given the state of the QB and the defense. It, you kind of have one. You don't have one until you have one, right? You, I think for, for a Super Bowl caliber roster, it's very rare to be in the situation the Vikings were in in like... 1988 when they felt like they were one piece away and they made the Herschel Walker trade, right? Like that doesn't happen a lot. I think it requires your young players to step up. So what are they away from a Super Bowl caliber roster? A decent free agency class, a decent draft, but then they need like Lewis seen to learn how to tackle and become a good player. And Brian awesome wanted to become, you know, to, to contribute more like that. That's what they, that's the kind of thing they need or absolutely nail a draft class. Tyler the Lions did it. It's how the Saints did it for, you know, three years with their 2017 class. It's how the Seahawks won one. If you can home run like insane slam dunk a draft class, like look at the 2017 Saints draft class. It's insane. You get that draft class. You're a Super Bowl caliber roster. And I think that is pretty universal to every team. Get your 84 jerseys out, says Cordero Patterson coming back to Minnesota to be a running back slash kick returner slash punt returner. Would you be excited to see it? I do not believe Cordero Patterson returns punts. Uh, as a kick returner, sure. A little long in the tooth these days. As a running back, I, I dig it a lot. <laughs> I'm into it. Because he knows what he's looking at. He is pretty experienced as a running back nowadays. It's been a while <laughs> since the days of him being a wide receiver that took just jet sweeps. And we thought that maybe he could like read out zone. He can read out zone now. Atlanta taught him that. Chicago spent a bunch of time teaching that. We could reap the rewards without having put in any of the investment that other team, you know, of development that other teams did. That'd be pretty sick. Uh, but I don't think he'd be an every down kind of guy or anything like that. So like, sure. Yeah, sure. That's what it, I, I, I guess. Uh, Viking Jack says, my unbiased opinion as a Welshman is that Luis Reese Zamet 
is going to take the NFL by storm and will play to a Super Bowl standard no matter which position he plays. But what do you think his athletic profile suggests and which Vikings job is at risk? Highlights on YouTube. I purposefully did not look up who this is. I, I fully expect this to not be a football player. Ah, yes, a rugby player. Okay, that would have been my first guest. And he's trying to get into uh, into the NFL, huh? He's 6'3", 216. That is, I mean, that's a good quarterback size. Can he throw? Is he a thrower? Is he a quarterback? If not, perhaps he'd be like a smaller tight end or like a bigger receiver. Uh, that would be probably the the size profile. I'm, I'm going to look into this uh, no more. That's my answer. Receiver or if he can throw, he's a quarterback. Minnesota sports appreciator, which means, hey, look out, Kirk. Succession plans in place. Uh, Minnesota sports appreciator says, when are you going to remove the you like that on three? One, two, three, you like that from your intro when Kirk leaves? Uh, yes, that's always been the deal. There will be a Kirk thing in the intro until Kirk leaves. It probably will not be replaced unless there's like another quote that's that says feels as perfect. But that's so perfect. It's so good. I love it so much. Uh, Chris says, which individual players are you rooting for in the playoffs? Dalvin being on the Ravens feels nice. Uh, sure. You can, yeah, root for like former Vikings somewhere. Personally, it's Lamar. It's Lamar Jackson. He's gotten such a bad rap for so long. Uh, people have been, we'll go with uncharitable to him for making a lot of the same mistakes that other quarterbacks make, but because he's known as a runner, he's, he's not right. He's not the way that it's supposed to be that every little thing is going to get kind of mountains are going to be made out of molehills. I would love for him to get a ring and, and shut a lot of people up. I think that would be super, super sick. Uh, tomorrow there will be another show. What I'll say on it. Anyone's guess. We'll probably do more of the, uh, the, the like state of the room things. I'll talk about like the DB room and the DL and stuff like that. Probably do two on the DL, like outside and inside. Uh, we'll, we'll keep all that rolling. I'll see y'all tomorrow. And as always, skull.